Let's just get in the stand up with our Bibles. Though the covers be worn and the pages be torn and though places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. This old book is my guide, tis a friend by my side, it will lighten and brighten my way. And each promise I find soothes and gladdens my mind as I read it and heed it each day. To this book I will cling, of its worth I will sing, though great losses and crosses be mine. For I cannot despair, though surrounded by care, while possessing this blessing divine. Did you bring it with you tonight? Amen. Hold your Bible up. All right, what a joy it is. You ought to always have a copy of God's Word when you come to the house of God. Moms and dads, you ought to make sure your child never leaves the house without their copy of God's Word when they come into the house of God. Amen. Teach them at a young age. You never go to God's house without your Bible. If you ever, you say, well, the church where we used to go to, they didn't use the Bible, so I'd find, I'd find them in another church. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, they put the words up on the screen. That's not the same thing. You ought to have a Bible in your hand. Amen. 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 Now, I know we're living in a digital age, but there's something about it. You weep on your digital products, you're going to ruin it. You ought to be able to weep over the pages of Scripture and have tear-stained pages. Amen? Right. See, when you fall in love with the Word of God, it makes a difference. Amen? Let's, now, if you wonder why I always do that, I always pause after, because I cut all that out before we put it on the Internet. Open your Bibles with me tonight to the book of Romans, chapter 6. Romans, chapter 6. Romans, chapter 6, as we continue in our series, our short series on tearing down the strongholds of your life. Depending on how far we get tonight in this sermon, we will either finish tonight or next Sunday night. Probably next Sunday night. Okay. Uh, but we're tonight, we're kind of bringing this whole thing. It's been about five, four or five messages, I forget now, on, on tearing down the strongholds of your life. And tonight, I think, probably is going to be one of the, the kind of the best way to wrap it up, uh, you know, in a two-message sermon tonight on Romans chapter 6, verses 14 through 23. And basically, and here's the message titled, We Have a Choice. If we have strongholds in our life, understand is we have a choice. Now, well, let's go ahead and read our text and have prayer, then we'll set the stage for what Paul is dealing with here. Notice what he says, and let's, let's go ahead and back up to verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Are you following along? Verse 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Megenote is the Greek word translated mean. May it never be. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered, unto, delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity... Even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then, and those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto Holiness, there's that word again, twice 
in the couple of verses. Holiness. And the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have a choice. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray you'd add your blessings to the reading and the preaching of your word tonight. Help it to be an encouragement to those that are here. Help us to learn how to live the victorious Christian life. How to hate sin. How to love righteousness. And how to live in holiness. In Christ's dear name, amen. And you may be seated. In the preceding passages, Paul has indicted the whole entire world under the condemnation of sin. If you have studied the book of Romans, you understand in the book of Romans, the first chapter, he says that the whole world, verse 20, Romans 1.20, is without excuse. There is no one that has an excuse for not coming to saving faith in Christ. He said uh, they have that the witness of creation in Romans chapter 1. Therefore, they are without excuse. In Romans chapter 2, by the way, when I say the whole world, I'm talking about the whole Gentile world in Romans 1. That's who he's dealing with in Romans 1. Romans chapter, chapter 2, he deals with the Jewish world. And he talks to the Jews and says, Thou therefore art inexcusable, O man. The Jewish world is without excuse. Romans chapter 3 he said that all the world may become guilty before God. So again, the whole world is under the condemnation of sin. And he deals with that. Romans chapter 4, he talks about a man by the name of Abraham who became, as it were, the father of, 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 of New Testament faith. The father of faith in God and in Christ. And he talks about how it's by faith and not by works that a man is born again and believes. In Romans chapter 5, he comes to the place and he says, he says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he talks about the precious gift of God that is, the, that is ours by faith. And that how by faith we experience the grace of God that forgives and absolves us of our sins. And so the natural conclusion of mortal man at the end of chapter 5 was that of every time I sin, God gets to show his grace and his goodness. Then I should, I should, should I not sin more so that the grace of God gets on display more? And of course, what the, he opens up in chapter 1, what shall, verse 1 of chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue? That word continue means to habitually live there. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the first of two times we read the second time ago, here's that word again. God forbid. He said, how can that be possible? Look in verse 2 again. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He said, if you're dead to sin, how do you live in sin? Now, and he goes ahead in the next 11 verses and he talks about the fact that we were, that we experienced literal death with Christ when we got saved. As he died on the cross in our place, we died with him. We were buried with him, verse 4. We were raised again to walk in newness of life, in verse 5. Then he says, he comes down to the text that we begin reading tonight in verse 11. Talking about, and he says it twice, sin hath no more dominion over you. If sin doesn't have dominion, the word dominion, no rule, no authority, no power over us. Now, there are some that have, over the generations, have preached a doctrine called sinless perfection. That you can come to a place in your life where you are no longer sin anymore. In biblical theory, is that possible? Yes. There was a man who has lived on this planet Earth, lived here for 33 and a half years, and never one time sinned. Jesus Christ. You say, but he's God. He was God, but he also lived as a man. He was as much man as he was God. He was at all points tempted, like as... We are, yet without sin. 
it would be, it is possible to live a life and never sin, but it has never happened with mortal man. Has it? John said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's not a person here. Now, there are people uh, back several years ago, I guess seven, six or seven years ago, or maybe not that long, I don't remember, some books began to be circulated in our church by author of Michael and Debbie Pearl, books about the family. The problem with, while they've got a whole lot right, they've got a whole lot wrong. Michael Pearl, I've got documentation. He said it. He, not, he hasn't sinned in years. So I, I, you say, you don't usually name people, but no, when it affects my church, I do. And so I say, and I say don't read them books. Because they're, they're dangerous. That's the worst kind of dangerous when you've got a, some truth intermixed with error. Amen. So they're not good books to read on the family because they've got error in them. False doctrine, false teaching. Now, having said that, what is a stronghold? We saw it back. It's that thing that's a continual, repeated, habitual sin in our life that we cannot seem to get victory over. We've looked at how to deal with it. We've looked at how, looked at how to, er to eradicate it. We've looked at the examples of people in their life who had wrong friends and therefore strongholds were reinforced. Tonight, I want us to see what Paul has to say about not being ruled by a sin in our life. If the Holy Spirit penned this, and he did, Twice in this passage, he said, sin does not have authority over us, right? Doesn't have that authority. Then how is it that we keep on? He says it, you know, through here in this, these verses, we will, and the, the, as we're dealing with tonight, we're going to see law and grace standing in great contrast one to another. The law says, obey me and you will not sin. Grace says, trust me and cease from sin. Can I say that again? The law says, obey me and you will not sin. In other words, the law says, do this, do this, do this, do this. Don't do this and this and this and you're not going to sin. But grace says, trust me and cease from sin. Now the trouble is... Are we still going to sin after we've been saved? Obviously, yes. But if we truly got born again, we get to the place to where we don't want to sin. While we may not be sinless, we want to sin less. Amen. Amen. Because it ought to grieve our heart as much as it grieves his heart when we sin. And if we're ever going to get victory in our strongholds in our life, we're going to have to understand this principle that we have a choice. Can a believer live a life of victory and joy? The answer is yes. Do we have some examples in the Bible? There's two men that the Bible says walked with God. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Before, before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. We don't know a whole lot about Enoch, except we do know something about his preaching. Jude gives, a, gives the outline of one of his messages. But he rebuked this ungodly world of this ungodly deeds which they had ungodly committed in ungodly ways. He wasn't the popular preacher of the day. There was another man, though, who walked with God, and Noah walked with God and found grace in the sight of the Lord. And when the Lord flushed this earth with a gigantic flood, because of their wickedness and the evilness of their hearts, he spared Noah and his family. While, it is, while we may not live perfect lives, it is possible to walk with God in such a way that our sin does not hinder our walk with God. Is that what you want? Have that victory in your life? Folks, we could talk about addictions. There was a time when addictions were... You know, you thought about addictions. You thought about alcohol and, and or drug addictions. Can I tell you, there's a lot more addictions today. Strongholds in the life of people. Today, our nation is plagued with the addiction of pornography. 
and it is fed by Hollywood and Nashville and wicked people. And it is an addiction. And we're plagued with it. There's addiction. I'm convinced, while we don't think of it as a bad addiction, I think we are convic addicted to digital life. I was, reading in the, I was reading in the news this week that doctors are now having to deal, they've diagnosed a new medical condition called eye posture. Have you seen it? The addiction of Facebook and all this, and so kids are doing this all day long. Eye posture. It's a real, real condition that they have now diagnosed. Addictions. As much as I love technology and I'm a gadget guy, if that means more to me, some of y'all saw my, I posted this, I scheduled it. I, did, I was not on Facebook this morning, all right? I scheduled it last night to post this morning early. All right, now you've checked Facebook. Have you checked the book? Which one did you check first? Can I tell you, you've got an addiction when you open your Facebook before you open the book. And you'll never have victory in your life till face, when Facebook's more important to you than this book. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just checking my Facebook. I've never, I've never had the privilege of saying, hey, what are you doing? I'm just checking the book. I need to know what I need to do here. This is all introductory. I told you it's going to be a two-part message, didn't I? But I'm just talking about addictions. Folks, we can live a lot. We may not be able to live a sinless life, but we can live a life where we sin less. And we can live a life where any sin convicts us. You see, it's possible. We do not have to be snared in the chains of sin's bondage. I want to give you some reasons why. I want to give you four reasons why we don't have to be bound by sin's bondage and the strongholds. Number one, we find it in verses 12 through 13 of this text. Number one is because grace reassigns us. Grace reassigns us. We must choose righteousness over unrighteousness. Grace puts us in a new category. Grace takes us from being under the law to being free in Christ. Amen? Now again, you know how we preach it here. We'll give more detail on it. Grace is not a license to do what we want. It's a, it's a power. Grace is a power to live as God wants us to. To live as God wants us to. Believers have been reassigned from the reign of sin to the reign of grace. No longer must we bow before the evil throne of sin and wickedness. This is a positional truth. What do I mean? When we got saved, we may not have noticed any outward change, but inwardly we were moved from the realm of sin and its dominion to the rule of grace and its power. Something transformed. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Correct? And so it is a positional truth that we were dying in Christ. Look back in earlier in this chapter, chapter 6. Look with me in verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now understand, that is not talking about water baptism. That's talking about being baptized by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we baptized into one body. The Spirit puts us in Him. What a blessing that is. Therefore, we are buried with Him, verse 4, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of our resurrection, knowing this, of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Now, if the old man got crucified, what happened with that old man? He what? Does he live or die? Who crawled off the cross alive? Nobody. If our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be, what's that next word? 
In verse 6, that the body of sin might be, that's really it's important to keep your Bible open and pay attention, destroyed, that henceforth we should not do what? Serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Dead men don't sin. I have a message that I preached off this passage years ago called when, when Dead Men Stink. You know when dead men stink? When you keep unburying them and dragging their, that rotted corpse around. That's when dead men stink. And so many people can't leave their old self buried. They like going back and digging up the corpse of their old life. And all it's going to do is cause a stink in your current life. Amen? There's never been a corpse that has helped you. Amen? Never been. Now notice what he says here. That, we, that grace has reassigned us. In verses 12 through 13. So we learn because that grace has, re, has reassigned us. There's, uh, there is a three part the decision that must be made based on the fact that grace has reassigned us. First of all, it is a physical decision. Look with me in verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. What's that first little word? Let. In other words, do not give permission to sin. That's a choice. That is a physical choice. It's kind of like this way. You know, um, I remember back some years ago when the internet was first being opened up and first started coming out. Uh, how many of y'all have ever heard preachers pre back years ago preach against the internet? Did y'all ever hear that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, this, this preacher never did. You know, I'm too technologically savvy and I like the gadgets too much. I wasn't going to preach against it. If it was sin, I was going to enjoy it. But I wasn't sin. But the preachers had some reasoning about it like this. Well, there's so many dangerous places and spots, you know, on, on, on the... Worldwide, worldwide web on the internet, there on the internet highway there. There's just so many sinful. I mean, people could see things they ought not to see. I told one preacher, I said, I'm going down the road but down, seven, down 75 between Macon, Georgia and the Florida line. I said, there's all kind of junk places there, billboards up there advertising things that women ought not to be doing. I said, I just make a choice. I'm not going to get off the interstate and I'm not going to get off the highway and go in those places. Amen. It's the same thing for the internet highway. I made a choice. I'm not going to go to those places. I'm not going to... Get in, uh, you say, well, well, you know, nobody knows. Well, I could have pulled off I-75 going down... Some, if you've ever, how many of y'all ever tried to travel that section of the road? You know what I'm talking about. The billboards down there, they're, they're, they're disgraceful. Advertising, advertising adult playgrounds and all this junk. I just, I, I, I'm not going to... You say, well... I don't know why you wouldn't go. Nobody would have known if I'd have gone. I was by myself. I was traveling down to Riverview, Florida to preach. Nobody would know. But he would, wouldn't he? Right. And guess what? I would. And it's the same thing when you're in the privacy of your room with the internet highway. See, it's a choice that I make. I'm not going to let sin rule in my mortal body. Now, folks... That doesn't happen with happenstance. That's not, that is not making, a, as we say every year, a New Year's resolution. That is not turning over a new leaf. That is a choice that apart from this book, you and I will never make that choice. Why? Because we live in this thing. Well, now, I've already shared with you back a couple of weeks ago. It's not the old nature versus the new nature. What is it? What's the battle that goes on within us? It's not the old versus the new nature. What is it? It's the flesh against the spirit. Remember that. Paul said that the flesh warreth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. He walk in the spirit and he shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Not one time will you find the word old nature or new nature in the, in the Bible. It's not there. But it is a fleshly battle and a spiritual battle. And if I do not feed myself on this book, if I do not have a healthy spiritual diet, is this flesh going to say no to sin? It's not going to say no to sin. It's a choice I make when I choose to go a day or two or three or more without meditating. I didn't say reading the Bible. The reading the Bible gets you nothing. It's no different than reading any other book. Hey, you're not promised one blessing from reading the Bible. Every blessing is promised when you do what? Meditate. 
And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Joshua, when God was commissioning Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and that thou shalt have good success. It's meditating on this. If you can go a day or two or three or more, and you don't meditate on this book, you have made a choice to let sin reign in your body. This is the only thing that will keep you from sin. Every time I give out a Bible, I write something I heard years ago, and I write it. It's written in the front of my Bible. It's ri- I wrote it in the front of my kids' Bibles when they got Bibles. I, written it, I wrote it in the front of Peter and Titus' dedication Bible when we dedicated them when they were born. Sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. And that's the truth. Me deciding on my own that I'm not going to do something that's wrong will not keep me from doing it. But when I bathe myself in this book, when I immerse myself in the Word of God, when the Word of God, as Colossians said, when I'm richly filled with the Word of God, it will keep me from sin because I don't have to yield to it. I choose to yield to it. Is that not true? Amen? Amen? That's where we live. It's a physical decision. Do not let sin rule in your body. Many people choose to sin by putting their bodies in the wrong places. Now, do you want some practical application of that one? I know you do. You take a man or woman. You don't have to be young people. Old people commit immorality too. Right? You put a man and a woman that aren't married together along with each other. They're just business people riding on a trip together. He said, well, I trust them. You fool. It's not a matter of trusting them. I don't trust the flesh they live in, and I don't trust the flesh I live in. Place no confidence in the flesh, Paul said. Isn't that right? Preacher, that's not nice to say that. I didn't say that. God said that. But you said fool. Yeah, he who trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Proverbs said that. Isn't that right? It's funny. We were watching a television show a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, and it was one of these scenes where somebody was leaving. And, they, and uh, he hugged his cousin and said, well, just follow your heart. I said, oh, there it is. Giving a fool's advice, isn't it? Epitome of Proverbs, follow your heart. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Can I tell you this? We're talking about when you put your bodies in the wrong place, you've chosen to let sin reign. Young people get themselves in trouble because young boy meets young girl and they go out together. And mom and dad are foolish enough to let them go out by themselves. Preacher, don't you, don't you believe it? they got a date? No, they certainly don't. A teenage boy and a teenage girl should never, ever be alone with each other. Hello, talk to me. I know. Some of y'all, don't, y'all looking strange at me. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, what does it say? I've quoted a thousand times here. It is good for a man not to what? Touch a woman. You say, well, that's talking about a sexual touch. It is not talking about a sexual touch. That means touching. It's the Greek word, same word, that when Jesus touched the blinded eyes and healed them. Same word. Told you that before. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. I promise you, you put a good boy, a teenage boy and a teenage girl in a car going on a date alone, they're going to touch. You say, well, it's just holding hands. That's touching. God says, don't do that. He said, if you got to do that, get married. That's what 1 Corinthians 7 1 says. You don't touch till you get married. Boy, you, want to, you really want people to really think you You want your family to think you've done falling off the edge. Tell your family that. But... They gotta hold hands. No, they don't. And they won't get pregnant before they get married if they don't start holding hands. Hello. Hi. Teach that to your young people. I'll never back up on that one. I've seen too many lives ruined with immorality because somebody didn't tell them that's dumb. You've chosen to let sin reign in your mortal body. Some of you, you could bear testimony to the fact your mistake happened. Yes, God forgave you. Yes, you got over it. But would to God somebody had said, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't get in the car with him alone. 
Isn't that right? Y'all still with me tonight? Y'all going to come back? I'm trying to save these precious lives. Hey, these young girls here, a precious gift to give their husband when they get married. Amen. Same thing for the guys. To give their wife when they get married. When they stand at the wedding altar, they ought to both be pure. Amen. First time they touch, first time they kiss, ought to be right here. Listen, you, you can go... You can go to 99% of the churches in, the, in this city today and they're not going to tell you what you just heard. Because it doesn't line up with where popular opinion is. But it lines up with, hey, you choose to let sin reign in your mortal body. What, what's the most foolish thing a drunkard? If he, don't want alcohol to, if he doesn't want alcohol to rule his body, how dumb would it be for him to go hang out in a bar? Isn't that right? If you, if you are a man and you've had problems with pornography, how dumb is it for you to have unattended time on the internet with no supervision and nothing to be holding you accountable? Again, covenant eyes. Get covenant eyes. Put it on your computer. You can get it through us. It's cheap. Fifty bucks for the year. And it, all it does, you just tell it who your accountability partner is. Hey, make your accountability partner your wife, man. She gets an email report of everywhere you went on the internet last week. How's that? So well, I don't want my wife knowing all that. Why? What you got to hide? Amen. Right. See, it's a matter of not letting sin reign. In your, you choose to let sin reign. Is that not right? You choose to do that. I choose to do that. We don't, have to, we don't have to live a life of habitual sin, but we choose to put ourselves in places where we sin. It's a physical decision. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Don't, let, don't do that. Number two, it's not always a physical decision. It's a moral decision. Look in verse 13. Neither, what's that next word? Yield ye yourselves, your members, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. John Phillips points out, he says, three great words in this chapter summarize the secret of making practical and the life the principles of victory. The words are know, reckon, and yield. He, said, he, he says it here. Neither yield ye yourselves as men. I mean, he talked about knowing, knowing in verse 6. He talks about reckoning in verse 11. By the way, reckon is a, is a good southern term, isn't it? But in the Greek, you know what it means? It means to add up everything and hit the total button. And realize that you are dead to sin. You've mor you physically choose, but you morally choose. It's a moral decision. I want you to notice what he says here. Neither yield your members. Notice he didn't say your body. Your body has members. I've got arms. I have feet. I have legs. I have nose. I have ears. In other words, I make a moral decision that I'm not going to let any part of my body enjoy those things that will put me under the dominion of sin. That's the reason... I'm going to heed the wisdom of the little children's song. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. For the Savior up above is looking down in tender love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. David said, no wicked thing, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Job said in verse 31, verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? It's a moral decision. It's not only a physical decision. I could choose to keep physically. I could choose where I allow my body to go and what I allow it to do. Can I not? It's a choice. Uh, there used to be a popular youth pastor by the name of Dawson McAllister. I think he's still around and alive, but he used to be real big among young people. And he said he had a couple of teenagers, a boy and a girl, come up to him one day. They were both distressed and crying. They said, we, we had an accident. He said, he looked at him and said, it was no accident. You made a choice. 
He said, for both of you, and I'll, I'll, I'll since we're a mixed company, he said, for it to be an accident, both of you had to been walking down the hallway unclothed and bumped into each other. It was no accident. You made a choice. But morally, it is no accident either. I make a choice what I allow to go in my ears. I make a choice what I allow to go in my mind. I make a choice what I'm allowed to go in my mouth. I don't yield my members as instruments or tools, literally, of unrighteousness. And isn't that right? See, if we're going to get victory in the strongholds of our life, we're going to have to understand it's not, so, it's, it's not just something that we promise to do better next time. We have to make hard choices. For some, if, you, if you're struggling with an online addiction, maybe you need to get rid of the internet at your house. If you're struggling and you, you are willing to, you, you spend more time on Facebook than you do in the book, maybe you need to close your Facebook account. Oh, horror of horrors. How would I keep up with all my friends? I've got almost 800 people that have friended me on Facebook. I promise you, I don't know two-thirds of them. Now, I'm glad they follow me on Facebook. Apparently, people enjoy my humor. <laughs> <laughs> but, folks... If I'm more interested in what's going on in their lives than what I am going on in the Word of God, I've got a problem. I know this is real practical stuff, but that's where a lot of people live. I mean, I, I see some folks on Facebook, they're posting all day long. Now, I'm not there. I just see it when I see it. When I do the occasional times during the day, I might happen to notice something on Facebook. I'm thinking, and then all these people are sitting, spending all these stupid games like, what is it, Farm Farmville? And I keep getting invitations for me to play these different games. I ain't got time to play games. Souls are dying and going to hell. I'm not going to be playing no game on Facebook. Amen. Yeah, right there. Three of you need to come get right, don't you? I mean, we just got down to get a Facebook account. No, <laughs> probably next week he'll be an addict. No, not Dan. But I'm just telling you, folks, I'm not against it. I use it, but it's a tool for me. But do I have things I struggle with? Yes, but it's choices I make. And I have to choose not to allow myself to get in those situations. I have to choose. To be honest with you. I've always told my wife, you know, I enjoy taking risk. I, I you know... Men are more risk takers, than, generally speaking, than ladies, you know. Now, that's not always true, but generally speaking, okay? And I've always told my wife, I said, you know, if I, weren't, if I were of the persuasion, I could very easily get it. Now, this is going on over the Internet. Don't clip me just what I'm about to say. I mean, put it in the context, okay? I could very easily get addicted to gambling. I just enjoy the risk. I mean, and the, now I, I I couldn't do it because I don't have the money to do it. But if I had the money to do it, I could get in. I could get in. I could, you know, why? I just I, I I like trying to figure the system out and trying to play the game. My my father-in-law, my the, you know, my wife's dad. He's he's dead now. But my, he was. I we, we, I, I we, we, he was a gambler. I could always tell when he was winning. He shared the money. But uh, it would be easy to do. But you know what? I choose not to ever allow myself to get in those situations because that's just something I don't want the temptation. I've never done it. I don't want to start it because I know myself. Once, because I enjoy, anybody like me, you just, you, you, don't, you like taking risk. You like taking calculated risk and, and things. Nobody's, like, oh yeah, I, I, okay. Well, let's, honesty is good for the soul. All right. But those things, if you know you've got a weakness in an area. Now, I'm not saying I have a weakness there because I've never done it. I'm just saying, it, I know myself, it would be a weakness if I ever started it. If you know you've got a weakness in some area or propensity, propensity for something, don't allow yourself to be there. You're never going to defeat that stronghold in your life. You don't beat a stronghold by feeding it. Amen? You don't do that. It's a moral decision. It's a physical decision. You yield yourself. Neither yield if you yield, what is it? It's a conscious decision not to sin. I don't yield myself. I don't give myself to that. 
So, first of all, it's grace reassigns us. Because it reassigns us, we must make a physical decision. We must make a moral decision. Thirdly, we must make a spiritual decision. Look in verse 13 again. Neither yield yourselves as members of unrighteousness and sin, but what, what do we do? Yield ourselves to who? To God. While I make a moral decision not to yield over here, I make a spiritual decision to yield to God. Folks, is that a hard thing to do? Why is it that we have this concept in our mind that if I yield myself to God and I do His will and submit to what He wants in my life, I'm just scared to death of what God's going to do with me. He's going to send me to the outermost regions of Zambia, darkest Africa. Isn't that not the truth of what we feel about? That, if, that God is going to really come up with something He knows I'm going to hate and make me do it. Is that what you do with your kids? Huh? Yes or no? That's a yes or no question. No. Why would you think God would love you any less? Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the what? Desires of thy heart. Psalm 37, 4. It means He puts the desires there. If God wants you to go to the darkest regions of Africa, guess what? God's going to put a burning passion in your heart to go there. If you don't have that burning passion, guess what? God's not calling you there. You're safe. Okay? If you don't have the passion to go to Thailand and eat dog, you're not going. But if God wants you to be a missionary in Thailand, guess what? You're going to, great, you're going to wake up one morning with a great hunger for a chihuahua. <laughs> no, you're going to have a passion, right? Say, preacher, yes, I know. I ate dog in Thailand. And it didn't taste like chicken. <laughs> But all I'm simply saying is, you yield yourself. God loves you. He wants what's best for your life and what will bring glory to Him. Just yield to Him and say, I'm yours. Whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want, wherever you want, I'm yours. I'm going to do it. Until we can do that, we will never get victory over the sinful strongholds in our life. Because it's not just enough to say no to something. We must say Yes to something, should we not? Now, think about it. Is that not exactly what Jesus taught? Is it not? Absolutely. I want you to think about it with me. Jesus gave the example, did he not? That, remember the story in the book of Matthew? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. We were there back some time ago. It's been a long time. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Look with me in verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it, what, what's that word? Empty, swept, and garnished, decorated. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. And what Jesus is simply teaching here is what Paul simply is teaching over here. When you, you don't yield over here, you better yield to him. Because you cannot live in a vacuum. There is no such thing as an empty Christian life. You're going to be filled with something. And Jesus said the reason why it wound up worse for that man is because the man got his life cleaned up and cleaned out, but he didn't put anything in. And when I say no to unrighteousness and don't yield there, I better say yes to righteousness and yield to God and let him, his spirit fill me. Otherwise, that addiction is going to come back, that stronghold is going to come back, and it's going to be worse than it was the first time. How many of you have seen that happen in people's lives? They get cleaned up, cleaned out, but they don't fill themselves up with right, and they fall under the addiction or the stronghold again, and it's worse than it was the first time they had it. You could go over to the Bradley Center here in town and find case after case after case of that. Where somebody got cleaned up and cleaned out, but they didn't put anything in. And I, I'm thankful for centers like that who help people get cleaned up and cleaned out. But their shortcoming is they don't put anything in. And you can't, you can't, you can't fix yourself. It's God in you. Amen? So it's a spiritual principle. 
Do not give yourself to sin and do yield yourself to God. Amen? You with me tonight? Now, folks, I've, sp I've spoken very slowly, very methodically on this point because it is so important we understand we have a choice. Do we sin every day? Yes. But we must get to the place to where we don't want to sin, where we want to overcome sin, and while we may never be sinless, we live where we sin less than we did before. Amen? And that's where we need to live. Now, we're going to put, hit the pause button, and we'll finish it up next Sunday night. But I want you to understand something. It's a matter of choice. It's a physical choice. It's a moral choice. It's a spiritual choice that we make because we can make it. Why? Number one, what's the reason? Grace reassigns us. Say it. Grace reassigns us. It takes us from out under the dominion of the law and puts us under the rule of grace. We'll dig more into that next week. But what a pleasure that is, knowing that I don't have to live under the rule of sin. And it comes when I surrender everything that I am, everything that I have to God, and say, I yield to you tonight. Let's bow our heads. As the pianist comes, I think it would be appropriate to sing, I surrender all. Tonight, we want to sing that and mean it from our hearts. This altar is open for you. Maybe you come. Listen, you come, and I'll be the first to admit, folks, I've had to be here at this altar already because sin, sin in our lives is always a struggle because we live in this flesh. Maybe you need to come tonight and say, God, help me to say yes to you, to yield to you, and not let me yield myself to unrighteousness. Father, you know the need of hearts here tonight. Thank you for the privilege of being in your house. In Christ's dear name, amen. Let's stand as we begin to sing. I surrender.